And uh, let me find George here. And George Sinos, Sinos is going to yes. present first. And George, go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Well, um, I'm a member of our local NMRA division and a member of Omaha N Track. I got back into the hobby about 2000, right at the beginning of 2013, and uh, started out with a pretty small layout here. What I'm going to do is. I hit the share screen button. And I'm not sure if it's sharing or not. Is it uh, not sharing, yet. Eric? Not yet. Let me know if I need to hit the button again. Yeah, you want to open up. Do you have a PDF or PowerPoint or yeah. something? Go ahead yeah. and uh, hit the share. You should have permissions to do that and then choose okay. a particular window. All right, let me hit it again. There we go. Now it's working. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay. So even though I got back into the hobby in 2013, this goes back to um, my uh, College days, when I was a senior, I was an engineering intern at the uh, Continental Can Plant here in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, it's a very large plant uh, that had several production lines shipped both on rail and uh, by truck. And you can see from this current uh, view from Google Maps that the tracks have since been removed, but you can see here where they uh, they were at one time. This George, is Union Sorry, Pacific. which yes, uh, sir. which city is this? What city is this? Omaha, in? Nebraska. Omaha. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, this is uh, the Union Pacific Main Line in parallel where it parallels Interstate 80, and this little yard here is uh, to serve an industrial area that is kind of sporadically spread out from about 68th Street out to about 130 something or ever. This is just one of the larger industries that used to be there. That was at one time very, very active and not quite so much anymore. But at any rate, the uh, Continental Can Plant ended up kind of being the uh, centerpiece of my little switching layout. When I got back into the hobby back in uh, 2013, the, um, the point of this layout was to uh, just be temporary. It was gonna last long enough for me to learn about a lot of the things that have come along since I uh, had left the hobby a few years earlier, DCC and JMRI in particular were a couple, and, and to you know have something to play with, with the grandkids and uh, in the years that have intervened, um, you know, it's turning out that this actually is um, about all the railroad I need, even though I designed something pretty big to go in the basement. It's like this one keeps me pretty busy. So I'm not certain that I will actually ever uh, build that big thing down in the basement. Um, it's about 11 feet long when both modules are connected together. Two or three of the um, industries are pretty much inspired by the local industries in that industrial park. A couple of them are just pretty much imaginary. Um, an operating session lasts about an hour and I use a four to one fast clock and I'll tell you why in a minute. It's driven by an NCE system with a couple of proto throttles and um, the switchers I use a pretty compressed speed curve. The maximum speed is 10 miles an hour on this layout. So we're not in a hurry to get anything done. And you know, if you take advantage of that new feature and go back to the dispatcher's office in January of 2015, you can see an article uh, that was written before I ever uh, got any of the uh, DCC and any of that kind of, or excuse me, the JMRI and any of that stuff implemented. But that was my introduction back then. 
So um, at a local operating session um, a few years ago, it was kind of serendipitous. I bumped into a retired engineer that actually had switched the can plant during the 70s when, um, when I was uh, there as a student. And he um, filled me in on a lot of interesting stuff. But uh, some of the bigger things that I took away from that were that um, there were two 12 hour shifts and they were um, contracted to switch the plant twice during each of those shifts. Uh, later on, I learned from another co old Continental Can employee that the Chicago plant, which was quite a bit bigger, was switched three times in a 12-hour shift. So that worked out a little bit better for me for whatever reason. So in a 24-hour day, I actually have three four-hour operating sessions, uh, four fast-hour operating sessions. Each one in reality takes about an hour. Um, and uh, the engineer told me that they would bring up to about a dozen cars up to the um, up to the industrial park and switch those cars out and go back and forth to one of the bigger yards as needed. Um, and I just used those as the excuse to do my restaging. And uh, every other operating session, I'll clean out my little small yard that's there and replace them with new cars to be delivered uh, at the next session. Um, it's car cards and spreadsheets. The spreadsheet tells me how many cars of any particular type I would need and then I just pull the car cards uh, to make up a deck for the next operating session. Um, pretty randomly generated numbers within certain parameters of the different types and it seems to work out pretty well. Um, this is um, this is the uh, storage area for all the cars that aren't on the layout, and these upper three um, drawers over here on the right are the cars for the next three sessions. Uh, I pull those in between sessions so they're always ready to go, and I wouldn't have to stop and pull cards just at the time when I wanted to do a little operation. So back to the can plant. Uh, Continental Can, it, it, this was one of the bigger plants and they had four, like I said, between 12 and 14 production lines, um, depending upon the season and the demand. And there were several tracks that went into the, uh, the uh, factory. Um, the first track over here was the steel track and that's where incoming coils and stacked sheets would come in. That was the only place I wasn't allowed to go. I guess it was too dangerous for somebody that was just an intern. I'm not sure exactly what the deal. I could, I could see things through the doors, and I could, um, I could stand on the other side of the lo loading, the outside of the loading dock, but I could never actually go in into this particular area. This outside track was hardly ever used. Um, in the year I was there, there was only one time there was a tank car of uh, what they called Bunker C fuel oil for the heating system in the plant. Um, then this is where most of the activity takes place. Uh, these two tracks went into the loading docks that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. And this track actually didn't go into the plant. This track stopped right about right. Can you guys see my air? Is that easier to see? Um, it stopped right about right here. And uh, one of the this track, one of these two tracks on the loading dock, always had a gondola to where they could throw scrap. And on this track, they called it the scrap track because they would always have two or three empty guns there, so that whenever they needed to fill this guy up and swap him out with another empty, they they had ready empties available. Um, I made a couple of operational changes. I based things kind of on the 1970s shipping volume and maybe increase it a little bit. I don't want to have a one hour operating session where there's only one car to switch into the plant. Um, and a lot of the traffic that was truck traffic, I had moved back as, as rail traffic. Uh, the engineer told me that when he retired, the last thing he was running was a GP38 
Um, and currently, and there's very little traffic there now, but uh, currently they're using a GP60 that I see every once in a while. Uh, the rolling stock in my layout is, I have a pretty broad uh, era. It's, it's the no roof walk era. So that's, uh, that's about as broad as you can get, I guess. Um, 50 foot box cars and I've added into the mix more high cube box cars that would have been of it, been around in the 19 early 70s and um, steel came into the plant in box cars and in these specially constructed can stock cars that were made for the can industry to sh there they have this offset door that's a little bit wider so they can get one extra coil into the car uh, and still have a way for the forklift to get out. Um, that's referenced in that 2015 article, if you want more information about that. So I use the can stock cars, uh, covered guns, and then I've added modern coil cars into the mix. Um, the, um, now, I, I have to ask you guys, the, uh, a little part of this is covered on my screen. Is this covered up by um, pictures of you guys over here? Um, I'm not hearing any. No, I mean, you can move your, Here, if you're talking about this. like the zoom, the zoom yeah. videos of people, you can drag that window away. Yeah. I or think minimize it, it or whatever. Yeah. There we go. It's at least out of the far enough out of the way that it isn't going to hurt anything. So uh, this is kind of a top view of uh, the way things are situated on my layout. I've condensed the five tracks into four. Since there wasn't much activity on that outdoor track, I condensed it in with the scrap track. So on this, uh, well, we call it the scrap track. Uh, there's always the empty guns that are waiting to go in to be filled with scrap. Um, and uh, this at the end of at the end of track two, this is where there was a big crusher for uh, scrap metal. Uh, this is where that gun is. It always gets switched in right here and sits there until it's full. Um, a lot of the rolling stock that's delivered on my layout, um, it will be there for a random number of sessions. So what I've done is I've made these little load time cards uh, similar to f the four position way bills that says, okay, if this guy's gonna be here for 12 hours and I just put him in between or in front of the way bill, at the end of the session, I'll flip him down to whatever the next, it would be eight hours in this case, but you can see they start out 20, 16, 12 and eight. And then at the last one, when it's pulled out, you just have four more hours to go. And um, I don't do anything with rolling dice or whatever. I just say, you know, hey, G, pick a number and it comes back with whatever random number I need to put here. Um, so at any rate, that's a number of little things right there. Low volume products, all kinds of different products were, were fairly low volume and they weren't palletized. Um, they were actually loaded into the boxcars by hand. I'll switch over here for a minute. They would come off of the production lines on these conveyors and uh, the conveyor would come alongside of track one and uh, uh, the people in the plant. These guys are actually unloading. If they were loading, these ramps would be going down instead of up. Um, uh, no, cam, cans would roll down the ramp they'd grab a few of them with one of these rakes and then they would stack them up in the box car. And you can just barely see over here, there's a bunch of these cardboard separator sheets. Every few rows of cans, they would nail in one of these uh, separator sheets so that they wouldn't fall over in, um, whoops, so that they wouldn't fall over in shipping. Uh, at any rate, this took um, this took a couple of people about an eight hour shift in order to load these, uh, load these cans by hand. And those conveyors only came along track one. So any of the uh, low volume stuff that's getting shift, shipped out when the empty car comes in to be loaded, it's got to be put along track one right over here. Um, there's space for two cars at the loading docks inside the plant and then you can 
spot some out here uh, when they're if you have more more uh, more cars than you have uh, space at the loading dock. High volume product uh, like soda and beer cans, there could have been up to four production lines going at a time with um, the soda and beer cans. And those came off the end of the production line at about 400 cans a minute. They were pretty high volume. So they would come out, they were automatically palletized and stacked and wrapped by machines and everything that happened after that happened with a forklift. So. Uh, these could load a box car pretty quickly with a forklift and since my minimum increment uh, is four hours, they get loaded into a box car in four hours. So those, however, could go in any one of these, those empties could go in any one of these three spots because they didn't depend on the, um, the conveyors. They were palletized and they could, they could haul those anywhere they wanted to with a forklift. Uh, steel, steel came in to the loading dock, both in coils and in sheet form. Those would be four to eight hour unloading times, depending upon um, how fast they could get the cars unloaded. And uh, they also shipped sheet steel out that had been printed with labels. All of the can plants didn't have uh, printing presses like uh, Omaha did. So a lot of times they would get the bare metal in, they would run it through the printing presses, then they would ship out the stacked steel again to other plants. Uh, and then the miscellaneous kind of shares this spot over here. Um, all kinds of stuff came in. They would get box cars full of uh, drums of printing ink, pallets, the plastic wrap, that went around the uh, palletized stuff. Um, when they were changing over production lines, you'd get all the equipment in on a box car or whatever. So, you know, that's kind of maybe a lower volume thing, but that's where it goes on that track right there. So a typical job, um, typical job maybe here's the before and after the, uh, you might have four cars that need to be, are loaded and need to be picked up. These white cars here, they would need to be replaced because we're not finished with those yet. And you'd have a few cars that are outside uh, of the plant that need to be shoved in when space is available. And then you have a few more that are incoming. So after that job is over, it might look something like this. We've shoved those uh, green cars into the plant and left the white cars uh, in the plant. And, with, uh, and we've grabbed this one empty gun here and replaced the one that's at the end of track two. And then all of our incoming stuff is still outside the plant. And then we wander away with the stuff we've picked up. Even after the caboose era, in fact, today even, um, since they have to cross so many streets, they often have a caboose that's used as a shoving platform to get back to the yard. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the step by step here, but if you guys, um, I had sent Eric a copy of this and he can make it available for you to download if you want to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll post that up on the, um, the past, past media uh, page later today. Okay, thank you. And I'm just real quickly just going to talk about a couple of the other industries that I've shoehorned into this. There's a company at the other end of town called Airlight Plastics. Um, they take plastic pellets incoming in hoppers and they have these two tracks that they can unload with va a vacuum system into their silos here. And uh, then they have a storage track over here. Uh, the way that looks over on the switching layout is the two are here. The plant itself would be in the aisle, uh, totally off of the layout. And then we have a few cars over here for storage. And the same thing, you guys can kind of get a bird's eye view of this if you want to download the, uh, the, uh, the uh, PDF later. And the PDF has my presenter's notes in it, so there's more explanatory material. One other one that's kind of interesting is William Harvey that's on 67th Street. 
um, they make the wax rings that go underneath your toilet so it doesn't leak all over the floor. Um, they get petroleum product, some undesignated petroleum product, they wouldn't tell me what it was, that uh, comes in in tank cars and uh, they may, out of that, they make these, several different kinds of these wax rings. Um, they have two unloading spots and then plenty of room for off spots here. And I don't have a lot of room on the layout, so we have one unloading spot with a couple of off spots right here. And you can see that's kind of what a typical job might be as a before and after. And then seal test, my seal test plan is a combination of a couple of other uh, industries that um, it's basically there it ended up being imag uh, pretty much imaginary but it takes some of the characteristics of the fact that there is an ice cream plant here that's not rail served and then across the street there's this huge Nash Finch grocery warehouse that used to be rail served and they had a refrigerated side and a non-refrigerated side and so the seal test plant has one door that's re for refrigerated outgoing product, another door that anything else in a box car gets loaded and unloaded, and then one other one for hopper cars uh, full of salt or sugar or uh, corn syrup tank cars or whatever that would get unloaded here. Uh, during one of those operating sessions in a 24 hour period, a bunch of refrigerator cars get shoved over here into the utility yard and um, since we only have one door in subsequent sessions um, we'll always be switching one of those one of those reefers into that refrigerated door um, uh, at a time since there's only space for one and the last but not least there's a transload track with uh, pretty much anything else that me or the grandkids decides might be fun to look at when it's there since there's nowhere else to put it. Um, so all I'm trying to get across here is you can have an awful lot of fun with a really small layout. And uh, so if you don't have a lot of room, don't, uh, don't think you can't, don't think you can't have a railroad. So, <laughs> so there you go. That's, that's yep. it in. Oh, 21 minutes. I was pretty close to my... That's, that's perfect. So I've got some <laughs> questions for you here. Um, Al Dalman asks, how many cars on the layout during a session and about how many cars are in the total fleet if you have all the stuff that's in the, the drawers and so on? Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually counted because I thought somebody would ask that. Um, you, there's usually no more than a dozen cars on the layout at a time. And there's a little over 400 in the drawers. <laughs> so you bit. don't, it takes a while to <laughs> rotate through them then you're saying. Yeah. yeah. You know, the yeah. interesting, you know, that's the interesting thing. I read about these guys that say, boy, I don't want to see the same car at the same location in every operation. <laughs> you may never see the same car. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Bob Kalicki asks, what software did you use to create your track plan? Oh, that's any rail. Um, it's okay. yeah, it's pretty easy to use. All right. Uh, how long an actual time do your operating sessions last? Did you say an hour? You know, yeah, on the average, it's an hour. It might be 45 minutes. It might be an hour and 20 minutes. It all depends, you know, on the random nature of what, what comes up and what's still on the layout and that okay. kind of stuff. Um, Burr Stewart asked, how would they unload the cars on track two? Um, Burr, I'll put up the PDF. It actually shows step-by-step step how each track gets gets managed that'd probably be easier than explaining. yeah there was there was a big u-shaped loading dock that went around track one and track two so track one was unloaded from one side track two was unloaded from the other okay uh tom kane's asking uh, did these industries have their own privately owned switch engine or did they rely on the up for the car movements the ones i knew about used to uh, contracted with Union Pacific. Okay. Um, uh, Chuck asks, I noticed that one of the white cars was not returned to its original spot in the loading area. Was that typical or would this possibly lead to a car getting misloaded with the wrong products by the loading crews? No, it's, it, they could, uh, let me see. That may also be a, a side effect of not seeing the full step-by-step 
process there. Yeah, like right here, the steel track, this car, after they pulled this guy out, they didn't care where this guy went. That You know, there was only four coils in there, so it's okay. not, yep. you know. Um, and the same thing on Fairlight, they said they tried to be, they tried to be nice to the railroad and they could unload any car into any silo with the vacuum system. So they, they were particular about what got pulled out, but they could put back stuff anywhere they wanted to. It didn't make any difference. Got it. Um, how tall is the layout and how do you uncouple cars? It's a little over 40 inches and I use a um, skewer to uncouple. The, the it's N-scale, skewer. by the way. I don't think I said that. Yeah. The what? I said it's N-scale. I don't think I said that early okay. on. Okay. Yeah. I think I. you said you're an N-scale group, so. Oh, yeah. Um, my end track. That's right. Chuck's wondering if those wax rings would get transloaded into a dump truck. I, I guess they'd be boxed <laughs> up and... Boxed yeah, they're up and shipped, shipped out in, so. our, in trucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, Bruce is asking how many operators, max and min. You know, um, usually, like me and one of the grandkids, or me and one of the other guys from N Track. You know, it's it's there's not a lot of room in there. In fact, the the reason the reason it's situated the way it the way it is is. So the younger grandkids, here it is, the younger grandkids can stand on the other side, stand on the couch and, uh, and operate on the other side of the, on the other side of the layout. Wait, wait. So you're saying that children can figure out how to use DCC? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. My three year old <laughs> grandson, he's, he, he only blows the whistle, but he's anxious to do something. He's else. good at it. He know he can find <laughs> yeah, that that F one or the F two button. <laughs> All right, and what are you using JMRA panel? What is that? Is that uh, switch control there? Yeah, uh, like I said, uh, you wouldn't really need to use a panel for a small layout like this, but um, the whole point was to learn how to use JMRI. So it's good reason uh, and. Yeah, since then I've built the panels for uh, one of the other fellows in town, and I've built the panels for Omaha and track for their, for the, the switching parts of their yep. layouts. It's good, good reason to learn something. So, um, uh, Gerald, the uh, just so people have the URL uh, or virtual past. Um, for everybody, I put the URL into the chat window. Um, that PDF will be up uh, later this evening along with the, the link to the replay. So, um, George, thanks so much for presenting. Um, we, we've had a number of people ask, well, you keep talking about these great big layouts. How can I do operations on small scale? I'm like, well, that's pretty small. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, it's actually well, I'll a great, say one thing. Yeah. One other thing. Um, I didn't add this until about four years of messing around. You know, it was like yep. um, this, this added a tremendous amount of uh, versatility, but I worked just on the six foot long section for a long yep. time and had a, had a ball. Yeah. It's amazing what you can do with, I mean, that's, uh, you know, a nice, a, a well-designed switching district, you know, not a, not a puzzle or a, those awful time saver things, but a well-designed place that you can, you can switch a reasonable number of cars and a reasonable amount of time. Uh, these are, these are great. Um, well, and on the average, I, I operate three to five times a week and um, you know, I, it always astounds me why guy and and building is itself a hobby. I know that, but it's like, man, I don't want to spend, time building a gigantic layout and then only be able to operate it once a month when a bunch of my friends come over this, you know, this, this yep. really has paid back quite well. Well, not monetarily 400 box cars later, but you know, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, that's a, uh, you're, you're a collector. That's, that's not a problem. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's only a problem when sure. you run out that's of space. <laughs> so. All right. So thanks again, George. Thanks for presenting. You we bet. appreciate it. Do I have, what do I do to, unsh oh, there it is. Stop share. Yep. There stop sharing. 
So um, my mic here. We'll go on to Bill Bill Messicar here. Let me uh, unmute him and spotlight him. All right, Bill, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and. Uh, All right. And I hit the. Uh, uh, down on the, you can go ahead and share your screen if you have uh, your presentation to share. All right. I uh, see so your desktop, so good to go. All right. Go ahead and right. introduce yourself too. Appreciate it. Yeah. Will do. Uh, Got to get the slide things out of the way. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Bill Mescar. I'm um, a member of the uh, Pacific Northwest Region NMRA Fourth Division, and uh, I've been a model railroader for over 60 years, I guess, and. Uh, this layout uh, that I'm going to present um, has, I started uh, started it in um, 2005 and it was finished. Well, let's see, not, it was finished essentially in five years, although we've made some changes to it since then. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about how I operate it, how I developed an operating system. I use a uh, uh, a car forwarding system called RR Ops or ROPS that was written by a local programmer. I have no idea of the language or code or whatever, but that's his hob part of his hobby. He's an excellent N SN3 modeler. And um, uh, he gave me this program and he's given it to some of the other modelers in the area. And we're using that to do our car forwarding. So I originally, uh, developed uh, or used uh, the standard Micromark car cards and waybills, wrote up all my waybills, um, and uh, used that for about the first 10 years. I've used this system for five years, and that's the system I'll talk about. So let's go ahead. Are we, you seeing this okay, everyone? Are we, are we on? Yeah, you're on. Um you're sharing because you're sharing your desktop we're seeing the current slide and we're seeing your essentially okay. your presenter view i need to go back to my screen and go to the other one yeah um, go ahead and hit end slideshow there okay hang on a second. Uh, up at the very top there's an end slideshow button um i'm seeing stop share is that it no 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 um okay here hold on let me let me take control and I'll fix it for you. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, let me see. All right. Hold on. Let me let me get it. Let me get it. Okay. So you're just putting it over on the. Do you have more than one screen here? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then uh, what you want to do in Zoom is share the share the screen that actually has like the presentation yep. view. Okay. So I stop share and go back to that. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, share screen. Let's try screen two. There we go. That okay. looks better. All right. Sorry about that. No big deal. Okay. So here's the uh, the concept and size of my layout. It's HO scale, uh, transition era. I had a separate building built next to my house. When we moved here, it was a basketball court. My basketball playing days are long over. And uh, so I had a garage basically built there. Uh, but the bill and there, there's a garage door, but it was all wall boarded over. So it's a 24 by 28 foot structure. Uh, I have a one level layout, no duck under. Uh, and the, basically the layout, I'll show you some pictures of it, but it's like a letter E with the, um, with the long 
one peninsula along the back wall being the yard, and then two peninsulas of six feet that are divided down the middle by a two foot high scenic divider that are divided into different towns or locales in Southern California on the third district. And I'll go over what that geography is. I've been very interested in citrus packing houses from living in Southern California, although I didn't grow up there. And so I want to have a layout that basically modeled this operation. Um, and as I mentioned, it's transition era. And then subsequent to completing the layout, I added a passenger terminal. I'll show you where that is in the back. It represents sort of the LAUPT, Los Angeles Union Passenger Terminal. But it's really two locations. My yard is both Los Angeles and San Bernardino, and so is the passenger terminal. I'll show you another picture of that. Here's the geography of the third district, and I think everybody knows Cajon Pass. That's that's this layout through that's this part from Barstow down to San Bernardino is the first district on the Santa Fe Los Angeles division. And then the second is this famous passenger operation through Pasadena where all of the name trains ran, but very little freight other than a local ran there. All the through freights ran on the third district because the grade was lower. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, the house were there were a lot fewer uh, crossings and population uh, back in the day. So here's a picture that uh, or a map that John Signor, uh, the uh, editor of the Santa Fe and uh, SP historical magazines created. And it shows with this orange color some of the uh, citrus operations. And by the 50s, there was very little actually left along that second district. So the third district was mostly freight and it had a few passenger trains and that's what really appealed to me. Now, one of the key things to understand about the Santa Fe operation in Southern California, as far as freight is concerned, that product originating in the Southern California area, essentially 85% of it traveled east. So there were a number and most of it was citrus well more than half of everything that moved out of Southern California was citrus operation in the early 50s. And that was done by uh, turns, which are trains that operate from one yard or one location out to a destination, turn around and return. So these turns, these fruit turns were all operated from San Bernardino to various points along the third district and would uh, then return with uh, essentially most, most uh, citrus. Uh, in uh, iced reefers or reefers to be iced. So I wanted that operation as part of my layout. I have modeled San Bernardino uh, Riverside, which you see right here, uh, Corona, and a little branch called the Elsinore branch uh, that fit along the back of one of the sections and Placentia. I've modeled those three towns as representative of that district. Didn't, didn't have the space to do more than that. So the layout operation um, has citrus turns. Of course, it also has many through freights. And it had uh, two passenger trains, the Grand Canyon uh, in the early 50s that operated uh, in both directions from Chicago to Los Angeles and back along a southern routing through um, uh, New Mexico, uh, Texas, and so on. And then a San Bernardino local that operated for for some years up till about 1953. And so uh, that gave me a little bit of passenger operation. And then the westbound fast mail that brought uh, sealed box cars of magazines of sealed mail and so on with a writer coach that operated um, from Chicago to LA, uh, uh, again, through the third district, but the, then the return train went on the second district because it was, essentially empty. And then there were yard switching. Now here I've uh, taken creative license and added some industries to the San Bernardino yard to make a yard uh, switching job, uh, or actually several yard switching jobs. So here's a view of, uh, on the right vertical is the, ba is the uh, back of my layout room. You can see the yard just in the far distance. And then the other two pictures on the left uh, that's the uh, passenger terminal. There are 
three tracks for the San Bernardino Local, the Grand Canyon, and the Fast Mail. And then there is a track uh, that represents the buildings that were present there basically on the north side of LAUPT to receive express, mail, baggage, uh, REA. And those are all bottled there. And so when you're building the uh, fast mail, for example, the cars uh, are all here and you have to pull out the ones you want and then put them on the track and bring the motive power. The bottom picture shows you the pre-cooler which was a, a structure unique to San Bernardino on the Santa, on the Santa Fe, where uh, citrus loads were brought to San Bernardino from all points in Southern California. Then those refrigerator cars were either pre-cooled, which you see with those tubes, you can just make out under that covering. Filled air was blown into those uh, citrus loads to get the temperature down to about 35 degrees and then they could be iced or if uh, the pre-cooling or was not needed or was applied by the shipper, um, these cars represent the icing that occurred there. And there were four, there were four tracks there in the pre-cooler. Uh, the upper area is just an engine service area and you can see some of the industries. There's an interchange track, there is a cattle pen rest area, there's a feed area, and then there are some other industries I've added. Uh, this is a view of the yard on the right, <clears throat> and I'll talk about the size of it and so on. Then the town of Riverside is in front of you, and the trains depart here and come down here. Now, there's also a track along the back, you'll see later, where the trains leave Placentia and go to Los Angeles, which is track seven to the, uh, it's the outside, and the inside is San Bernardino. Although on my computer, all the yard is considered one location. Here is the, um, so the main line continues through Riverside and then behind here to Corona, but there's a branch uh, that comes out of Corona and it's laid along this main line. It actually went south, but this is the place I had for it. And there are some different industries um, here in this location so the train comes into um, uh, Corona, uh, a train that's uh, like a Corona turn. I'll talk about those in a minute. And then it would have cars that would go down the branch. You can see the main line continues. And that then, here's a panoramic shot and that comes down through Placentia. Uh, here's a shelf holding my 400 cars that uh, George mentioned and then the line continues down grade back to the uh, LA, uh, LA yard. You can kind of see where it, the backdrop uh, that divides, the scenic backdrop that divides all those areas. Okay, uh, one of the things that I did actually before the layout was built is I did some research into freight operation because I wanted to have my operation represent um, I wouldn't say identically, but for pretty similar to the operation that uh, the Santa Fe would have for freight trains. So I mentioned that there were, uh, most traffic went east, but 15% of the traffic did go west. So if you're running fruit turns that go from uh, San Bernardino Yard to one of the towns, and I actually have one to each of the three towns that I mentioned, um, and then they return, how does a car move from one of those towns west to Los Angeles? Well, the answer was, and this is what the Santa Fe did, they would take one of their through trains, not the hog special, of course, but one of these uh, other trains, and they would have it stop and make local moves and they would pay the crew extra for local, local work. And those were almost always just pickups, not, uh, not set outs. So that would add a little bit of time, but that would move the traffic um, on into Los Angeles and then, or to interchange. These are, are pretty well-known trains, the Gateway Special, Texas Daily Forwarder. These trains all operated uh, westbound. And I have one of those, uh, one of the through trains that does that local work I talked about. Uh, there were certainly eastbound trains. Uh, the train that they ran uh, at least in the early 50s, was called by, I guess, the old heads and dispatchers, the Bulldog. 
they didn't run a pickup or a local freight on the third district. Those were handled by the, the turns. They did on the second district. So this train, the Bulldog, operated from Los Angeles, and it was mostly a train to move empties. Um, at Hobart Yard being next to UP Yard, they had a train there uh, that they would run occasionally called the Boxcar Special, and that train was virtually 100% empties, 60, 70, 80 cars carried from San Bernardino and then made it, then distributed to the other trains that were going north to Texas, to Arizona, to all the, so basically all that freight was moving out to San Bernardino and it was divided up there. I run a Bulldog. Uh, it does a little bit more work uh, than the Santa Fe did, but it's essentially carrying empties and other uh, things to San Bernardino and beyond. I have this train available if, and this train is primarily a yard job where you basically make this train up in the yard and then you run it from LA to San Bernardino. So the work is in making up the train. Um, here are the passenger trains. Um, I talked about the San Bernardino local. It ran daily in each direction between San Bernardino and LA. It consisted of a, uh, 15 foot passenger baggage, uh, baggage express. It was really the catch all for any, any uh, mail or any uh, baggage that needed to be taken to San Bernardino and sent on. Um, were passengers would take that from towns where the through train like the Grand Canyon didn't stop. So if you were like in Placentia, you could get on this train, take it out to San Bernardino, get off and then get on one of the better trains or even the chief or a super chief. Had one or two heavyweight coaches, usually two, and that's the way I operated with a pair of uh, GP7s that were equipped uh, with what we what I call torpedo tubes uh, to provide um, uh, service on that train. And then the Grand Canyon was mostly heavyweight. It was a real mixture of cars uh, it did not have the finished look of the, the Super Chief El Capitan and so on, but that's that's fine. I have a storage track for sleevers and coaches in the yard. I have another track uh, that you'll see in a minute that where the food service cars are kept. So diners and lounges are kept near a, a look, the commissary where the provisioning is done. Uh, and then the head-end cars, of course, are there on that track I showed you initially. So. Whoever's running this train has to make that train up. Most of the work is to make up trains and run them for through trains and passenger trains. The turns are the ones that do a lot of local switching. And they're already pre-staged, but I'll talk about that. And then the fast mail, I mentioned that as a combination of baggage mail, express, and with one writer coach. So the yard operating structure, as I mentioned, meant represents both Los Angeles and San Bernardino. Passenger terminal represents both locations. So trains can start in that one location and run east or start in that one location and run west. Depends on the train. Uh, the yard has 15 tracks, seven for eastbound, seven for westbound, and one for passenger storage. It's a track I added in the back. When I added the passenger terminal, I needed a place to store passenger cars and so I added, fortunately I had the space to add another track back there and it makes I think an interesting operation because the crew has to take the switcher in the passenger terminal, go into that yard area, get their cars and bring them back and build up their train. The freight trains are pre-staged and blocked uh, because the yard is really a departure point I initially started out with the yard being a place where trains were made up and quickly found out that that was where all the work was and I wanted to move that work out and have it out on the layout. So, and you'll see a little bit more in a minute. I, I dispatched by train sequence. I'm gonna talk about that. The um, eastbound Bulldog uh, is already pre-staged and ready to go. And it makes setups and pickups, but it has to run in sequence with the turns that will be in town. So. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then a westbound train 43 will also make local pickup pickups for traffic headed westbound past Placentia. Uh, I have signals. I have three 
single track mains between uh, the yard and um, uh, Placentia, between Riverside and Corona and Corona and Placentia. And so those um, protect uh, the three single track mains. You need to have a green there before you can um, enter that main line. Here's a typical train sequence. My operating sessions um, are generally four crews of two people. Um, certainly one person can operate one of these trains, but it, you know, it can, uh, works a little easier with two people, obviously an engineer and a conductor. Uh, there's no point to assign a brakeman because whoever's closest is gonna do the uncoupling. And since somebody asked that question, I like Rick's, but I have picks there. I find most of my operators uh, use picks. And then I have one guy who's uh, just built himself the thing that Jack Hamilton had in the tool junkie with the toothbrush and a mechanical pencil. So, um, and I have uncoupling ramps, uh, which are coming very handy. Here's the sequence uh, for my trains. And this is generally the order. So placenta is the furthest town from the yard. That uh, train typically will go first. It's made up and ready to go. Uh, I've experimented with having the crew or having it already on the layout and the crew just goes there. It could work either way. Then that's followed by the Corona turn that will stop in the town next to it. And the Riverside turn is the last town. So if I've got a fourth crew, they can either work a, a yard switch job or they can work building the fast mail. The advantage of the, of the passenger train is that they're not in the yard as much and they're not working back to back with a crew that's doing the Riverside turn. So, so then uh, I have to make a decision when the crew, this train requires that Riverside be uh, turn be finished and not occupied because that's the first town this train would work, the uh, train 43 westbound. So if that train is finished first, then I might send that train. If the Placentia turn is finished first, then I'll send the Bulldog because the Bulldog will go out east, go along the back, and we'll head to the Placentia first. And then the San Diego local can run uh, either east or westbound at any time uh, I need a passenger train to run. So that's generally, and, I use, and I'm always there to assign that sequence based on what I see the crews uh, doing it. There's, so there's not really much point in a fast clock. It's essentially freight switching. Um, so let me talk for a minute about the ROPS. I'll just call it ROPS operating program or car forwarding system developed by Bruce Hanley. Um, and I've had this system for four years. Uh, Bruce does, uh, you, <laughs> Bruce had this program working for a couple of years with SN3 guys who typically have about 25 to 30 cars on their layouts. My car, my layout has over 200 cars. So the first couple of years I used this program, Bruce found a lot of problems, or I, I uncovered a lot of problems because of the size of my layout, but he's fixed all those and the thing works great. So basically the program generates a train switch list based on spots, industry bills, available car, and a number of other things you have to put in once, as you do with most of these programs. Uh, it eliminates the need for car cards or way bills. The crews got used to this, and I had a number of keys, visual keys for them to use um, with the car cards or way bills. This is so much uh, more intuitive, I guess would be the expression. The crews get a list of what they've got to do, and you just follow it. And I'll show you a visual of what that looks like. So I mentioned the freight trains are pre-staged. Um, uh, and I mentioned the sequence they run. Uh, there's a local switch job that's run in San Bernardino and uh, that also comes out of this program. Typical operating session with uh, these eight operators or with any crew is typically three to four hours to run the eight or nine trains that I've listed. Um, the advantages of this, um, no car cards or way bills. Um, the program, um, I, I put the printed sheets on a clipboard. I should have stopped and pointed that out. And on the fascia is a big uh, Velcro pad that you can take your clipboard and just stick your clipboard on the fascia. 
to hold it so you do not need to lay it on. We don't want you laying it on the layout. My trees have got enough damage. So you get immediate train generation. You just tell it where you want to operate and it will immediately generate the train and then you can accept that or make changes. The, another nice feature of the program that uh, I've operated on uh, another club layout where there's a big problem with the train. You show up with it, it's got five cars and there's only room for two on the, on the spot. So this program has a, a feature obviously to limit the number of, of cars you can uh, spot on this particular location. And it does that automatically, keeps track of what's moving in and out. It allows local moves, meaning that I can, uh, if I have a Corona turn and I want the program to look for other cars that are now empty at Corona and are needed, uh, a box car, for instance, needed at another industry, I can permit that or I can exclude it. So, for instance, in that through train that I talked about that would carry westbound traffic, I do not allow it to do local moves. I only do it that way you can limit it to just set outs or pickups generally set up uh, pickups. Uh, it shows you the usage, how many cars, where they are. So it, it's a excellent thing. You can print that out and look and see exactly what cars are where and make sure they're in the right location. So you're not usually missing any cars. You don't have to reunite a way bill and a car card or a card with a, a piece of equipment. The bills yeah. themselves, Hey, Bill, uh, quick. Yes. Uh, we're at five o'clock right now. Um, how many? How, uh, I don't have I your presentation. More, I got about three more slides. Okay. I'll go, I'll go through real quick. All right. Um, you can, and you can edit with the program. Here's an example of the paperwork. You can see this list the cars that you're going to need in the train, but here's the order they should depart in. In other words, there's the blocking. This lists all the work. You can see there's local moves there, there's cars going from the train to industries and 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 out. So um, it's just been building the whole layout. You know, I had a plan and I had a five-year plan and I got a lot of help and stuck with it. Um, I traded a lot of times. I had somebody paint my backdrop. I had somebody build my bench work. It really, you know, I was in my almost 70 by the time I started. So um, that really helped. Uh, I had helpers and then other regular operators. We, we worked on a regular basis and you, you've heard the rest of this. So that is it and I'm ready to answer questions. All right. Um, so let's see, first question is an easy one. How wide are your aisles? That's a good question. They were originally 32 inches, but I found a little problem with the building. They ended up being about 30, okay. 31. I wish they were wider, but you know, that's what they are. All right. Uh, one of your first slides listed th theme citrus and proactive service. What is? It was should say protective service. What it what is protective? And actually, Dow, Al Dalman has a similar question. Okay. Where did you get the information for your uh, third third district freight ops of July forty seven? It looks like you have info and extras, which wouldn't be on an ETT employee timetable. Right. Do you have a Santa Fe condensed freight? Whoops. Hold on. There it goes. Okay. So let me, let's see, which one was the first call? Oh, the protective service. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, well, the Santa Fe is, uh, as some of the larger railroads are blessed with tremendous amount of research and, and material developed into book form by uh, historians and modelers. And so there was a refrigerator card book. Uh, that's got a, had a lot of information, uh, plus the Santa Fe chat line. So protective service basically is anything a shipper pays the railroad to protect their cargo. And so in the case of uh, ice, it could be icing, it could be occasional icing, top icing, which is crushed ice, it was sprayed on top of a, like lettuce. Uh, the uh, F, uh, PFE book, um, by Tony Thompson also has an excellent write-up on protective service. So uh, I had quite a bit of information. Right. The question on the uh, research on, I had access to employee timetables, not employee, sorry, I had access to dispatcher uh, sheets. So 
for the Santa Fe in 1947. In fact, I have a full set for the month of, I think it was July. Got it. So I went through every one of those dispatcher sheets, uh, recorded the trains, analyzed the work they did, how, what kind of loads, the whole thing. That's where I discovered this boxcar special that would run with, and about how many. And so I have way more information than I can ever use on my layout. But, and then plus, then of course, the employee timetables, I know about the passenger trains. Yep. All right. Uh, Bob Kalick is asking, is there a track plan we can view? Uh, let me see. I've got track If you want to, if you have something. Plan. If you have, have something pencil, that you can send me after the fact. Let me do that. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that and you can attach it. It's a it's a drawing so you can see what it looks like. It's not a very good one, but it's the That's only one I've got. Good so enough. I'll send you something. Uh, Dana is asking, do empty reefers come back west as expedited trains or mixed with normal freights? Uh, X, let's see. Uh, yes, they come west. Yes, they're expedited. Yes, they're mixed with normal trains. So in let's say Kansas City or Chicago where they're getting returning reefers, they'll take whatever, you know, maybe they got 20 and they'll put those into a train and add other tonnage. They won't wait until they get 85 of them and bring them all at once. They want to move them west. So yeah, because they need to be cleaned out yep. and reused. So get them back as quick as they can. Huh? Exactly. All right. Um, Pat Hyatt's asking is RR ops available to anyone? Does the, does the person have a website or anything like that? Uh, I guess the answer is no. Uh, he doesn't have a website. He's offered it to people who have asked him. So if you want to contact me, I will forward your request. If you're a person that thinks you'd like to use this program, uh, assuming we're not talking about 100 people here, Bruce is very generous and I... I think there's 20 of us or so that use it. He doesn't charge anything for it. He sends you free updates. So, okay. Uh, well, to the to the people I'll who are interested, um, email editor at opsig.org, and I will forward uh, those names on to you if that's okay, Bill. That's keep perfect. You from getting yes. blasted. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And Wayland asks what the switch list looks like, and you already showed that. So. Yeah. Um, if, if somebody needs to see a turn or well or a different one, I can send you a copy of something. I scan that, but that's generally the look they have. Yep, I think they just wanted to see what it looked like, and you already did that. So, yeah. um, it looks like that's all the questions. So, Bill, thanks so much for presenting. Appreciate you jumping on ours uh, uh, from uh, the uh, what was it the the one that uh, Burr was running, the Pacific Northwest oh. group, that I think that's where we connected up the first time. So. Right, the PNR Fourth Division. Yeah, yep. we've got our yep. own YouTube channel now. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, if Bill, what, the other thing is, would you mind sending me your slide deck? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Okay, and we'll put that up for people to see. Um, sure. There's a lot of good information in there. So, okay. again, Bill, thanks for thanks so much for presenting. Um, uh, we do appreciate it. So with that, we're going to...